Ken, your regular Malaysian funny man who always says Ken on behalf of HSBC Malaysia. Thank you for joining us today on our live event where we talk about two very important topics, finance and children. Before we dive into today's discussion of raising young money managers, let me share with you some interesting statistics gathered from the 2018 Financial Capability and Inclusion Survey. Did you know that when it comes to saving and budgeting, one in 10 Malaysians currently believe that they are not disciplined in managing their finances. Did you also know that when it comes to readiness for unexpected rainy days, 52% of Malaysians state they would have difficulty raising 1,000 ringgit as emergency funds. And finally, when it comes to planning for retirement, almost 50% of Malaysians are not confident of having adequate funds for retirement. This brings us to today's discussion, which is the extreme importance of starting financial education from a young age in recognition of its responsibility as a leading financial institution and in line with its We Can, We Do initiative. HSBC is determined to equip young Malaysians with financial knowledge and empower them to make the right decisions at every step of their future. Folks, moulding our children early will help them grow into financially responsible adults later in life. And the panel of speakers we have today are here to tell us how. Joining us today are Stuart Milne, CEO of HSBC Malaysia, Lo Ken Ming, Head of Social Business and Special Projects from Teach for Malaysia, Lily Shah, Editor of Parenthood Malaysia, and parent duo Aisha Sinclair and Shanaz Karim. Also with us today are Senior Officers from Financial Education Network and Interagency Grouping, co-chaired by Bank Negara Malaysia and Securities Commissions Malaysia. FEN's purpose is to promote effective delivery of financial education initiative to Malaysians in a sustainable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, today's dialogue is unique because not only do we have distinguished panel of speakers, we've also got two very special moderators who will be hosting this illuminating panel discussion. You're probably wondering, what's so special about these moderators? Well, for one, they work very closely with the team at HSBC and Teach for Malaysia to put together the HSBC Financial Guide, providing all the illustrations for this fantastic resource for teaching children the value of money and how to use it intelligently. Secondly, they're also amazingly 14 and 12 years old respectively, which makes them exceptionally qualified to preside over today's discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to brothers Sheldon and Emerson Chong. I'm super excited to have them on board with us today. So without further ado, take it away, boys. Hello, my name is Sheldon. I am 14 years old. I'm glad to be moderating today's session today. And hello, my name is Emerson and I'm Sheldon's younger brother. I am 12 years old. It's great to have you all here today. To all the viewers tuning in, do feel free to drop us any questions you have for our panelists in the comment section and we'll get to them at the end of this session. Before we start, we want to make this discussion as interactive as possible. So, to the viewers tuning in, we have our very first question for you. How has the events of this year affected your approach to finance and money management? So, without further ado, let's get to know our panel of speakers. First and foremost, we'd like to welcome Stuart Mill, CEO of HSBC Malaysia. Stuart, do briefly introduce yourself. Thank you, Sheldon and Emerson. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be on the panel with you today. My name is Stuart, and as you said, I'm the Chief Executive for HSBC in Malaysia. I've been learning about um, finance for 40 years already, and I'm still learning today. I'm also a father of uh, three children who are now adults, so I know a little bit about teaching young people about managing money. I'm uh, really looking forward to being part of this illustrious panel today. Back to you. That's fantastic. And we're just excited to be part of today's session. And can't wait to hear from you in a while. Now, off to our next panel speaker, Lo Ken Ming, Head of Social Business and Social Projects from Teach for Malaysia. Hi, Ken Ming. Hey, guys. Just really, really uh, privileged to be part of the panel this morning, um, this afternoon. And I think at Teach for Malaysia, we really put our students at the center of the work we do. So I'm particularly excited to have um, the both of you um, like paneling the session today. Alright, happy to have you on board, Ken Ming. 
Sharing things from a media perspective, we have Lily Shah, editor of Parenthood Malaysia. Hi Lily, welcome to today, today's session. Hi guys and hello everyone that's watching. My name is Lily Shah and I'm the editor of Parenthood Magazine. So I really want to thank HSBC Malaysia for having us here today for this wonderful opportunity for a greater cause. And you know, raising financially wise children for a better Malaysia tomorrow. Certainly, I am looking forward to sharing our insights from a media perspective. Thank you, Lily. With your experience in dealing with parents and all things parenthood related, this will definitely add a different angle to our discussion today. And also representing everyday parents out there, we have a pair of parents here, Aisha Sinclair and Shanaz Karim. Hello, Aisha and Shanaz. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Sheldon. Hi, Emerson. We're really looking forward to the conversation today. I'm not just sharing our perspective as parents, but hopefully learning a thing or two. Uh, because Stuart said early, earlier, he's been learning for four year, 40 years about finances. Well, we're still learning ourselves too. Yeah, I'm looking at the list of panelists that we have right now. It sounds really, really awesome and looking forward to hear some point of view from everyone. So Stuart, you said something? I was just saying happy birthday to you. I think it was your birthday yesterday, <gasps> wasn't it? Yes, it was. Thank you so much. Last but not least, we have four senior officers from the Financial Education Network with us. And today they are... Inchek Nizam Ibrahim from Bank Negara Malaysia, Dr. Zainin Binti Bidin from Ministry of Education, Puan Sarina Arifin from Perbadanan Insurance Deposit Malaysia, and Puan Siti Norila Binti Shamsul Bahri from Permodalan National Berhad. It's great to have you all here. Let's now get to our right main agenda for today. Stuart, let's start with you. Studies have shown that there are improvements needed to raise our levels of financial understanding to a level that is ideal for our economic and social well-being. As a leading financial institution, could you share HSBC's perspective on the matter and what the bank is doing to address and improve financial literacy amongst Malaysians? Sure, well thanks for the question Sheldon. First of all, uh, financial literacy is really lacking everywhere around the world, not just here in Malaysia. And in fact, with interest rates today at all time lows, it's even more important now that we all understand how to manage our finances better so that we're prepared for the future. At HSBC, actually, financial literacy has been at the center of our thinking for quite a long time. We've got many long term partnerships already behind us in this area. For example, uh, working with the Bank Negara on their school adoption program, the Buku Wang Saku. Uh, we've been working with Junior Achievement uh, on their More Than Money program and with AKPK as well in this area. So there's a lot of work that we've already done. These efforts have mostly been through engaging directly with students. And what's new and exciting about this new financial guide initiative with Teach for Malaysia and the Financial Education Network is that we're publishing a fun tool for parents to use to engage their children in the home starting at a much younger age. Ultimately, what we want is to empower Malaysians to take charge of their own financial future. And by doing so, we can cultivate a real can-do spirit and deliver on our brand promise at HSBC, which is, we can, we do. Thanks, Stuart. So we realise there's a strong commitment to reach out to people around our age. HSBC takes the effort to ensure that we have a better understanding of how money works. It's been great working with them on creating resources for our peers. We've both learned quite a bit about finances during that time. Next, I'd like to ask Ken Ming from Teach for Malaysia on their work reaching out to disadvantaged communities in Malaysia to reduce their education inequality. In this process, where does education on financial literacy come in? Thanks for the question, Emerson. Uh, I think I'll start off with a quick story. I, I once taught a class of Form 2 students in a fisherman village and um, when we were speaking about money, I think my students uh, replied that uh, money management for them is, is looking at a, a box of money in the house and if there is money, they would have enough uh, for recess today and if there wasn't any money, uh, they wouldn't have anything to eat. And I think that just shows, it's not really a generalization, but it shows that there is an absence of planning um, within the, the, the young generation, especially amongst our youth, in particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds. So 
Uh, for us at Teach for Malaysia, we strongly believe that a child's education shouldn't influence um, their future opportunities uh, and that they, they do have the potential right, with, with access to a quality education. And this access to a quality education is not just an academic syllabus, but it's holistic right, from the kind of experiences, um, the kind of conversations they have, uh, and financial literacy comes in quite crucial in this area. Um, we also think about this thing called a vicious cycle of education where um, the quality of your education will determine uh, the kind of job opportunities you get, hence um, the job opportunities you get will then influence the kind of education that you can afford for your children. And similarly, if we think about financial literacy, it works the same, right? So if we start off really young not being uh, developing those strong habits, um, it leads to us having poorer habits when we are grown as an adult, even though we may make uh, a sum of money, but we're not able to manage that well. And so then we are not able to put our children through a good education as well. So and hence the, the vicious cycle. So I think for us, we really do want to empower students. And what we think about in terms of um, quality education is students being empowered with a choice. And with choice comes knowledge, experience and skills. Uh, and hence, financial literacy is a part of that and plays a key role in, in building a strong foundation for their future. Thanks, Ken Ming. It's great that both HSBC and Teach for Malaysia actually share the same principles of inculcating the values of financial literacy in Malaysians from a young age. Of course, it's never as straightforward as that. So, Stuart, perhaps you could also share with us just how HSBC sees parents taking on a leading role in instilling good financial habits with their children? Sure, Sheldon. If you think about it, children develop habits, whether they're good or bad, when they're still very, very young, you know, typically three, four, five years of age. And at, at that age, children are spending most of their time, in fact, all of their time with their parents or their family members, rather than at school or university or with friends outside the home. So it makes real sense to engage children at this age through their parents in a fun way, right in the home. Many of life's Early lessons are learned through uh, the medium of stories or fairy tales. So why not treat financial learning in the same way? Make it fun, make it natural. Because children who, who learn about financial affairs early often become uh, much better equipped to make good financial decisions in adulthood. So, you know, the investment in time and effort really does pay off. Thank you, Stuart. Ever since we were brought on board this initiative, We've been learning a lot on how important it is to manage money properly. Hence, I for one can now definitely see why teaching financial education to children is crucial and should be started from young. To the parents tuning in, what are some of the challenges you face when teaching your children about money? Okay, now let's move on to Lily. As the editor of a publication with a wide network of parents, do you think enough parents talk about or actively help their children understand money? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, financial topics and financial management can be a very dry and, you know, daunting subject, kan? So, parents also, they, they just don't know where to start. They, they how, how are we supposed to do it? Do we just sit down your child and give like a two, three hour lecture, you know? And also sometimes, but parents themselves, they're not really equipped with financial uh, knowledge themselves. So, they probably just brush the subject under the rug and they don't want to talk about it. Mostly Asian parents, you know, they see this topic as something like a taboo. It's, you know, something that only parents should be talking uh, talking about it. Kids shouldn't be even worried about how uh, we get the money or if there is money or not, right? So, parents are not engaging enough in... Um, sharing knowledge in terms of money managing for their children. I guess you can see why it's sometimes it's difficult for parents to have the money talk with their children. But from what I've observed in this discussion today and the content we've worked on for the HSBC Financial Guide, this seems like a crucial conversation. Sheldon and I were fortunate to have our parents explain a lot of these concepts to us at a very young age and we hope that with what we've produced, a lot more children can also have this very beneficial information at their fingertips. Now, Lily, from your personal experience and observation, could you share with us some of the methods and tips on how parents can broach this conversation with their children? 
first of all, it shouldn't be like a one-time lecture or a one-time conversation. The talk works best when it's not exactly a talk at all, you know? So parents who incorporate financial lessons into everyday conversations, they have the most strongest influence on their children when it comes to money, you know? Whenever there's an opening and whatnot, um, just often speak to your ch children about earning money, spending money, tell them about what credit card is, what debt is, what interests are, and tell them about the differences between needs and wants. Children as young as two years old can already understand the concept of money. For example, I'm, I'm just going to give you an example, right? So a two-year-old goes with mommy shopping. I mean, the baby can already see that, you know, mommy is exchanging this colorful pieces of paper to the cashier so you know they already oh okay there's an exchange um in order to get the items that we pack in the cart from a very very young age they have a, a kind of like a understanding or a concept of what money is right when you're managing your money don't hide away in your bedroom let your child see that you're actually managing your money so you know let them see that you are working on these important financial tools this gives them the opportunity to ask like what are you doing mommy you know you can explain to them in a positive manner i'm managing the family money or family budget so from then on they already know like oh this is something important that i should know about or when i grow up this is something that i need to do and also if children has an allowance if you want to give children an allowance um it also teaches up to save you know instead of uh, we're always buying for the mommy can i have this buy mommy can i have that buy right so instead of doing that why don't we give them an, an allowance and then they can choose do they want to spend it do they want to save it for something that they actually really really want parents can choose to reward their child uh with some cash for example, like doing chores. I don't know about you guys, uh, Sheldon and Emerson, if your your parents give some uh, money in, when you guys are doing chores around the house and whatnot. So it really gives them the opportunity for them to learn the lesson and make uh, their own decisions about what money, um, what they want to do with their own money, basically. I think we should really, really refrain as parents, you know, if they already have an allowance and they finished up their allowance and they suddenly come to you and they're asking like, mom, can I have more cash? I don't have enough. I finish it all up on sweets or candy or or whatever on a movie and then now i need to go out with my friends so can you give me more money um parents should really really refrain from doing so because they need to learn and learn how to manage the money um, their money himself okay parents if you're watching uh parenthood.my uh, our publication they have a lot of articles on this as well thanks lily and to the parents tuning in at what age do you start teaching your children about the value of money now aisha and shanas You've got two kids who are very clearly precocious. How do you ensure that your kids understand the value of money and how do you manage situations where they ask you for things such as a new gadget or toy? Okay, so um, you know, when it comes to understanding the value of money, very much like what Lily was saying just then, um, you know, I try and have as open conversations as possible with them when it comes to money. Like um, they've even asked me, Mommy, how much do you make? Because, you see, growing up, that was like a big no-no. My parents never spoke about money. I believe Shana's also had very conservative parents when it came to handling of money. So I just try and talk to them about it and then, you know, to, and make them understand how does money come about, that we trade our service or, or a product to a business, and that's how money comes, that that kind of exchange in hand happened. For me, um, I like to teach my kids the value of things rather than how much it costs. For example, when I grew up, when I was a kid, uh, I had an elder brother. I was very unfortunate because I couldn't get a lot of things brand new. Most of the things that I get would be handed down by my brother. You know, I don't know whether you are hand, you're facing that as well, I must say. Because, um, you know, when I, buy, when I want to buy a new football boots my, and I go up to my dad, my dad will tell me, uh, why don't you go and ask your brother whether he has a pair of boots that he can lend it to you. So it's always hand me down for me. But that was where I actually learned the value of things rather than how much it cost. Because if it's just something that I wanted, um, I could get it uh, at a cheaper price maybe by buying used or getting it from someone who doesn't want to use it anymore rather than always buying, buying, buying. So I'm also kind of teaching that to my kids as well, especially to my uh, younger daughter. Yeah, but she's of course, six. similar like me, when I was six years old, I didn't really appreciate it because I never got anything new. Yeah. And I'm sure she's going through that as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah. We teach them, you know, bit by bit yeah. about the value of things rather than the cost of things. And whenever they ask for something, like, can I have this? 
um, you know, be like, okay, great. Uh, if it's really, really a big ticket item, then maybe we'll wait for a birthday. If not, okay, you have pocket money. How much of it are you going to put aside to spend on it? And then we never act immediately upon it. Like, mommy, I need this. I never be like, okay, I'm buying it now. You know, and, and except for if it's school stuff. But, you know, we'll just usually wait and then we'll have conversations about it. Do you really want it? Where are you going to put it? And I asked my eldest daughter especially whether she wants her allowance to be weekly or monthly. So if you go by monthly, then you'll see a bigger note. But if you go by weekly, you'll see a smaller note. Yeah. So, and if she runs out of money at the end of the month, is, you know, she learned the hard way about budgeting. Yeah. And she keeps all her money. I, I'm, I'm not keeping it for her. So all her allowance, she keeps it for herself. So that whenever she wants to buy something, she has to take out her cash and she has to go buy it. So when she sees more cash going out, then she knows that she's going to stop for a, for a moment and actually ask herself, do I really want to spend everything that I've got right now? This is the kind of questions that I think is good for kids to have in, in, you know, at a young age. So thank you for that explanation. And as we've mentioned earlier, HSBC is in collaboration with Teach for Malaysia. They have developed a financial literacy guide and it's actually a good resource for parents to educate their children on the fundamental facts in a way that is engaging and enriching for young minds. Both Emerson and I were personally involved in illustrating the guide. Ken Ming, could you please share with us some more about the development of this teaching resource? Thanks for the question. We're thrilled to work with HSBC uh, in, in making this and I think we um, have been working really hard over the last five months, explored many different paths. We wanted to create guides for teachers and guides for, for many different people. But I think with the, the ongoing kind of COVID pandemic, a lot of learning actually happens at home with parents and it's informal as well. It's really important to actually create resources that parents can, can have. And I really like Lily's point, it's not a one-off thing, right? So you don't do like a workshop and then your kids are like financially literate. It's an ongoing conversation and kind of habits that you build. And I, I think when Lily, when you're talking just now, I, I remember my, my two-year-old son coming with his little bag and saying, I'm going shopping and I'm wondering like, how do you know? to go shopping and what coins are you paying with, right? So I think it is it is that conversation. I think as we were developing it, working with other Teach for Malaysia alumni that have experience both in the classroom as well as some of them who are working in financial institutions, we, we researched and shortlisted, you know, all the key topics that we think would be really relevant for, for kids, right? And the best way to, to engage them, both kids and parents, is to make that interactive. So there's an element of gamification, but I think the, the key bit is that it is real life scenarios. It's about decision making, right? So it's not just about, oh, here is money. For example, if you go to the first guide, it's about spending needs and wants, right? And you might think, what's that got to do with money? Can't you just teach me about budgeting, right? But actually, money is, is, is mainly just a tool, right? Um, it's used to, to get something, either a need or a want, right? So between buying a, a new PS5 and, you know, having six months of um, groceries for your family, how do you kind of like balance that out, right? So I think there's a lot of these conversations that parents can start to have and I think with the guides we've we've put in a, a little bit of like a fun thing where you can earn badges for kids but also um, guides for parents to how to approach these really difficult topics, right, that maybe don't come out of everyday life but you can do little activities with your kids and I think it's about building that bond, right, because children don't just learn what you say, um, they learn from your example and, and what you do and so uh, we hope that this guide is something that would really um, entice students uh, as well as their parents. Uh, and we're really fortunate to also be in consultation with FEN, the Financial Education Network, to give us tips about how you know this can, can meet like, an industry standard as well, because we do want to make sure that it's of, of really strong quality. Finally, when we were thinking about conceptualizing it, wanting to make sure we put students in the center. And we heard about this uh, this boy who was able to illustrate really, really well. And, and that was with Emerson. And so uh, he started drawing. And, and actually, a lot of the drawings that you see on the financial guides today is, is all uh, illustrated by Emerson himself. So just really shout out to, to the both of you for being such champions at young ages and, and being a role model for other kids as well in, in financial literacy. Thank you, Ken. The Financial Literacy Guide is actually, yes, yeah, it's a good step to help children develop a good understanding and relationship with money. So, could I ask all the parents tuning in, what methods have you used to educate your child on the importance of money? Besides the guide, Stuart, what does HSBC have installed to drive financial literacy under the We Can We Do initiative? That's, uh, that's a very good question, Emerson. For us, Developing financial literacy is a long-term goal. As a couple of the panelists have said already, this is not something that you just, you just have a conversation once and then it's all done and completed. 
It is a long-term project for us. Um, the launch today is just one step on that journey. For example, looking forward, the next thing we're going to be doing is partnering with Ringgit Plus, which is Malaysia's leading financial comparison website in a few areas, uh, such as tips for parents on how to engage kids on matters regarding finances. This is going to be shared through our HSBC social media platforms. Tips for adults on how to manage personal finance called Money Hacks. And we're also going to be creating webisodes uh, on personal money management that will go on to Facebook and our YouTube channels. So there's lots more coming down the track uh, as we work to develop financial literacy here in Malaysia. Watch our social media channels and you'll see more of this in the very near future. Thank you, Stuart. I have another question, actually. This is directed to Aisha and Shanas. As a leadership trainer, can you share your experience with like creating behavioral change when it comes to money management? How it relates to the industry that I'm involved in is when it comes to building a culture, you really need time. It's not something that can happen overnight. So uh, maybe there are some parents who wants to do the, yeah, like, you know, what Lily said, the talk. I, I don't think the talk really works that well as much as every day exposing them to everything that you go through with regards to finances. There are some times when you are feeling a little bit broke and you can't buy some things. Maybe it's, time, it's okay to share with the kid as well so that they know that parents is not always everything hunky-dory and everything is perfect and beautiful. There are some tough months and there are some good months. And both of us are, are pretty much like self-employed or you know we are working on our own. So they are green. Some, some months are really good and some months are not. So I think what is important is to have that culture of uh, being financial literate happening every day in your life together with your kids. Yeah. I think that would create a bigger impact, similar with the industry that I'm in, which is to develop culture. Uh, we always advise and we always consult corporations to actually get cultural practices in place rather than having like, you know, once every six months town halls, but instead having it a lot more frequent so that the culture can be seen, can be experienced, can be talked about on a daily basis. Thank you. And well, also thank you to all the panelists for this insightful discussion. And from today's session, it is evident that everyone has a role to play to reach a financially savvy and prudent nation. Yes, it is crucial for all of us to take action today so we can be in charge of our financial lives and achieve our goals. But let us not just stop there. Let us turn can into do and become can-doers together. Before we wrap up the panel discussion, let's see if we have actually any questions from the viewers. Okay, so we have a question here, which is directed to Lily. What is the right amount of allowance should give to my young kids like below 12 years old? That one is really a very, very personal question. Every parent will probably can afford to give a different, different amounts depending on how much they get monthly and so on. So right now as well with the economy, I know I, I've heard some parents saying that they give five ringgit as their allowance every day to school and some two ringgit. Parents, you guys have to think about that. How much can you afford to give your child on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis? Yeah, so that's really a very personal question. And I can't say exactly how much. Here's another question, and it is also directed to Lily. What are your thoughts on paying slash giving specific allowance for every chores they do? I think it's um very important actually. So I mean, my boys are still young. One is four years old, and another is just eighteen months old. But when they are older, of course, I plan to give them chores because personally, I believe whether you're a boy or a girl, you have to do chores around the house, okay? And then if you want to, to buy something uh, later on, or your kid has something special that they want, practically they can use their allowances to buy that special thing. Of course, aside from birthdays and special occasions you know where parents of course we will give in lah okay probably some parents might be thinking hey child labor we're paying our child to do work you know but no i think i think it's kind of like um you are teaching your child a very valuable lesson because when they grow up and when they go out into the real world they do need to work in order to earn money so same thing you can start from home do the little little chores like wash the car and maybe i'll give you five ringgit for washing the car or take out the trash or you know every simple simple um chores like that give them something practically like 
keep for themselves and then let them decide what do they want to do with that money. Thank you for answering. And there's another question which is directed to Aisha. So here's a question. Is peer pressure something that's hard to navigate for financially literate kids? So um, I actually don't think that financial literacy amongst children is at that level where it's like, uh, okay, let's just say, for example, academics, can okay? So, okay, you're an A student, I'm a, not an A student. So I know how it works. So I know how to up my game or whatever. But when it comes to financial literacy, I don't think it's at the point where, hey, you know how to handle your money. I don't know. Um, I think it's still a very new, a very, very new playing field in that sense. There's no peer pressure when it comes to financial literacy because they don't talk about it. They don't even have conversations about what's your allowance? What do you do with your money? What do you do with your savings? Because I don't think that we're having that conversation enough with them for, the, for it to be on their radar. I think for now, most of the time, the conversations that I have with my daughter with regards to peer pressure is that seeing some of their friends having certain things that yeah. they want. Yeah. And they want it too, you know. Yeah. So those yeah. are the kind of peer pressure elements. So I, uh, I try to be conscious about uh, wanting them to know that happiness doesn't come from buying materials. Uh, at that age, I think it's important, you know. My four-year-old is already asking me for a phone. <laughs> He's like, Mom, uh, I what do you want? I, I want a phone for my birthday. I'm like, dude, you're four years old. Oh my god. Wait, wait till you know how to pay bills. Then you can have a phone. <laughs> Thank you for answering the question. And our next question is directed to Stuart. How early do we set up a bank account for children? Well, you can set up a bank account at any time, actually. You can either set it up in a way that effectively you're controlling that bank account and you're putting money in say for birthdays or Christmas for money coming from grandparents or other other relatives and then when the child is old enough the child can operate the account on his or her own and I think that is happening earlier and earlier these days you know the old days of having even what we call IC packets in Hong Kong you know now it's all electronic there's no physical banknotes Actually, in the, in the COVID world, uh, that's a far healthier way to transact business anyway. So teaching kids about ATM cards. In fact, my kids at a very early age were saying to me, hey, dad, you know, aren't credit cards very old fashioned? I should just be able to use my iris or my thumbprint to get money out of the machine. Why, why do I have to have plastic? You know, in some senses, kids are alert to some of these things like, you know, saving the planet, not wasting materials. And all of that comes into this discussion around finance and money as well, I think. Anytime you can go down to your bank, you can very well can come to HSBC or any other bank actually, and open bank accounts for your kids at any age and um, get them set up. Thank you for the answer. So another question to Aisha and Shanas. Uh, as parents, would you agree to have financial literacy programs in your school? I think that is a very important subject. I think it should be in um, our national syllabus to teach them financial literacy. The, the effect is only going to come 15 years later. And I think uh, we want to see them really be able to stand on their own. Oh, yeah. With regards to financial literacy when yeah. they're 18. Because as a parent also, your challenge is you teach them as best you can, as best your understanding. And I mean, we're still figuring out our own finances as we go along. So we can only teach them so much. That's why it's really fantastic if, you know, with TFM and their fellows working on it, working with HSBC. I mean, it's really great because we know that there are professionals, you know, people who have more knowledge than us. And they're actually working on creating a system that will best help our kids understand that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's very important. And there is a, a, a possibility that sometimes parents uh, will answer based on also their beliefs and their understanding of it. So I, just imagine a scenario, right? A six-year-old or a seven-year-old comes up to the parents and asks, uh, Papa, what is interest? And the answer that you get is interest is evil, you know, because whatever that the parents are going yeah. through with regards to interest in their life. Yeah, whatever fixed beliefs they yeah, have about correct. it, right? So, so it may not necessarily be <laughs> the a neutral yeah. place of information. It's, it's good to have a, some kind of a structured um, understanding of financial literacy across the board so that everyone gets the same message, you know what I mean? There's another question. 
in online school, is it still relevant to give uh, like money to your child if it's online school already? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think when a kid's at home and not having all the, um, I guess, the, the urges to spend, buy stuff in school, then all the more you can teach them about saving and, and budgeting for something that they want. I, I don't think just because they're not going to school, you shouldn't give them any money. Like um, Then we're kind of perpetuating, like, you only ask me when you need money. So I think we should have that that kind of consistency in, in how much we give. It could be a negotiated rate, right? So now your living expenses are lesser because you're at home and I'm cooking. So, um, you know, we could adjust that allowance a little bit lower. But I think we, sh we still should be consistent in, in what we're messaging to our kids and the conversations we're having. And I think for them as well, um, they can kind of like, oh, after a long day of, of, of school, I can kind of like think about uh, what I can buy this weekend or, or something that we can do, right? But yeah, it's, it's about teaching them to manage, not so much like paying them to go to school. Yeah, so just balancing that out. I have another question here. Should a parent say to his or her child that the mom or the dad has no money when the child asks for money? Hmm. Well, we've kind of sort of out of like <laughs> desperation used that answer before because we like don't know what answer, but yeah, no money. Yeah, I think that's very common, you know. Uh, a lot of parents are like, ah, no money, no money, no money. <laughs> but I think if you do say you don't have money, uh, give them an explanation. Tell them why you don't have the money and why we can't buy that certain thing or why I won't give you that money for whatever you're asking for. So just give them reasons, even if you say, yeah, sorry, I don't have any money at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we usually say that. You choose not to, so I'm not going to give you the money for this because, or whatever reason, because you have seven pencil boxes, do you don't need eight, or whatever reason it may be, right? For me, it's, that, it's, uh, it's to say that I, uh, I don't have the money for this, whatever it is that they want to buy. It's not that I don't have the money, but I don't have the money for whatever that they want to buy. When I'm conscious about it, I'll try and probe a little bit more to find out why is it that they want it. What are they going to use it for? Is there an alternative to something maybe a little bit more reasonably priced or anything like that? But when I've got a thousand and one things in my mind, yes, sometimes I do come up with, no, nope, no money right now. <laughs> no. This is the last question. So which savings account is best for a child? But are there any specific plans? I think you just start with a very basic savings account uh, with an ATM card. Uh, that, that kind of makes sense. It's the very simplest product to explain to your child and then obviously as the child understands the concepts more you can go to slightly more complicated products like for example a time deposit where you have to lock up the money for say one month or two months or three months but you get a little bit higher profit rate or, or rate of interest. The best thing to do is start with the simplest thing, explain the concepts, make sure they're understood and then you can progress to the to the more complicated ones after that. But anyway, you know, at HSBC, just, just talk to your relationship manager. The relationship managers are very well versed in advising parents on some of this stuff as well, because we do focus on banking the family as a whole, not just banking the parents. So we'd be very happy to, to give advice that's tailored to your particular situation. Thank you, Stuart. And to the audience, thank you all so much for your questions and for being an engaging audience. Well, guys, uh, Sheldon and Emerson, I really have like one question for the both of you. I think I'm, I'm speaking for everyone here when I say that we've been all tremendously impressed by the knowledge and articulation that the both of you have showcasing hosting this panel discussion today. So maybe you can share with us your experience being part of this project and also how does it feel seeing your illustration come to life and making a difference in the lives of children your age? Thank you, Lee, for your question. Well, we are very excited to have had the opportunity to work with HSBC and uh, to inspire children about artwork and we learn a ton of new things and how important it is to manage your money properly. Yes, so when HSBC Malaysia first approached us to be part of this initiative, we were actually very intrigued of the idea of putting together like uh, educational material which would be illustrated in our style. And now that we have completed the first module, we've definitely had a lot of fun and we've also seen firsthand how this guy can actually help to reach out to people 
And so we hope you can actually go a long way to help them understand the importance of financial literacy. Well, actually, in fact, Lily, have you had the chance to go through the guide? We have a tutorial video on how to use the guide to teach children about financial education. Let's take you through it. Hey boys, how's it going? Hi, Hi Ken. Ken! We're good. How are you? I'm good, but I could use some advice. Oh sure, what's up? What would you do if I gave you 50 ringgit? What would you spend it on? Would you probably spend it on buying games and junk food? Well, we would save it first, and if there was anything we need, we would spend according to how much cash we have. Oh wow, that's really surprising to hear. That is the opposite of what my daughter Kasha would do. She would spend it all on sweets and games and toys and would hardly be able to save at the end of it. Like there would be even times where she asked me for additional pocket money, which is not only a bad habit for her, but it's not good for my pocket. No wonder you seem a bit worried. Tell me about it. I've tried to teach her on how to spend wisely, but I'm not sure she understands. Well, perhaps you could try approaching money management in a fun, easy and interactive manner. Money management? That sounds so serious. What do you mean? Have you heard of the financial guide developed by HSBC Malaysia? This guide was developed in collaboration with Teach for Malaysia. It will help parents teach their children the fundamentals of personal finance in a fun and engaging way. Well, sure. I mean, that sounds like something I would need. So, first things first, go ahead and take out your smartphone and then enter the financials.my into your URL. After clicking on the start button, you will see the animations featuring our main character, Lola, and the journey he's about to embark on. The first module will focus on understanding the concept of needs versus wants, which is supposed to teach you on how to prioritize your spending. Once it begins, you'll see Dola in his house. He is very excited because he's been selected to travel to a new planet called Planet Hex. He is told he can bring 20 things from his current house to his new house and you and your daughter will have to help him pack. In the next stage, Lula arrives at the space station and is stopped by an astronaut, Mrs. Wang. She tells him that his spaceship is very small and that he can only have space for 10 things. If you were Lula, what are the 10 things you would choose to bring? The module will then prompt parents to discuss with their children on the differences between needs and wants. This first stage aims to show children the difference between the two as everyone has different needs and wants that differ depending on the person. There will be four stages with several tasks to go through before you can successfully finish the module. There are also three additional activities for you to put what you've learned to the test. Oh, this is exciting. My daughter loves challenges and she could use a lesson on prioritizing needs and wants. I can't wait to see what's in store for the next module. Let's get ahead with it. Yes, a lot is in store, but always remember to read the instructions carefully every time before you click next. After completing each challenge, she will earn herself a badge. And you can download these badges by clicking on the download button. Thank you so much, Sheldon and Emerson. That was certainly a very helpful tool. Children need to know how to be able to be financially savvy from young so that they are able to make better and more informed financial decisions when they're older. Don't mention it, Ken. We are glad that we were able to introduce you to the financial guide. Do stay tuned for more modules that will be introduced in stages, which will cover other aspects of personal finance, such as setting financial goals, budgeting and saving, protection against scams, as well as the concept of lending. This is good, boys. Thank you. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Really can't wait to introduce this to Kasha and I believe that this can nurture and shape her mindset when it comes to saving and spending. And if this can help Kasha, I'm sure many other children would definitely benefit from this as well. I shall pay it forward and help as many people as I can by sharing this HSBC financial guide with all my friends. Glad we could help. All, All the, the best, best Ken. Ken. Bye. Bye. Viewers, 
We hope that you found this session insightful and we hope that the advice shared by our panel will help you guide your children in their journey of financial education. Thank you very much to our panelists, Stuart, Ken, Lily, Aisha and Shana for being part of this discussion. We would also like to thank our guests and senior officials from the Financial Education Network, Enchik Nazim, Dr. Zainin, Juan Sarina, and Juan Siti Norila for gracing us with their presence today. Thank, thank you, you everyone, everyone and, and bye! Wow guys, now wasn't that a very insightful webinar? To all parents who are watching this, if you need some guidance starting the money talk with your children, this toolkit is the first step that would make this journey an interesting one. So head on over to financials.my and check out this guide with your kids today. If you're not a parent, you may have nieces or nephews that can equally benefit from this as well. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. For more information on money management, visit HSBC Malaysia's Facebook page and stay tuned for more upcoming modules of this guide. Let us all be a part of this initiative to raise financial savvy leaders for a better Malaysia.